Warning, if you don't want to hear adult language, it's already too late to fuck off. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by the new energy drink exclusively for white supremacists, Hemlock. Hemlock. What, you're going to suddenly trust the mainstream media now? And now, The Scathing Atheist. This is a public service announcement on behalf of the CBC. It has been brought to one's attention that there is an ungodly podcast being circulated in the seedier parts of the internet. That's right, Archibald. We understand it's by those damnable Chimpions fellows. Chimpions, you say? Is that Chimpions TTRPG? Aren't they the chaps that play a game where they pretend to be cowboys? Yes, that's correct, Archie, my old brute. And not only that, those damn cads are saying that we did, in fact, evolve from filthy monkey men. It's June 2nd. And it's Yell Fudge at the Cobras in North America Day. <laughs> what? <laughs> no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Ethan Wright. And from Paul Rudd's, New Jersey, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Waycross, Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, Republicans demand church separation from the human secularist state. Yelling at a cobra is the most reasonable cobra thing a Pentecostal preacher ever does, it just occurs to me. <laughs> and Anna will be here to up the talent average by a considerable amount. But first, the diatribe. I was struck by a memory the other day. I'm, I'm maybe 15 years old at the time, and my dad is in the midst of a furious screed about French fries. Now, now, this in itself is not all that noteworthy. My dad had a habit of working himself into an apoplectic rage about inanimate objects. I, I mean, I, I obviously get it from somewhere. But in this instance, the target of his tirade was how much better McDonald's French fries used to be. See, until 1990, McDonald's cooked their French fries in a combination of vegetable oil and beef tallow which is you know, slightly healthier than giving kids chicken fried cigarettes, but not by much. So a bunch of parents groups pressured McDonald's into changing out to all vegetable oil in 1990. And, and good intentions or no, in my dad's mind, the taste of his French fries was too high a price to pay for healthier children. Of course, in an effort to justify his fury, he had to make it about more than fried potato sticks. So he explained that it was a symptom of oppression. It was tyranny of the fitness freaks. His words, as I recall them, were, it's a shame that a small group of people complaining can screw things up for everybody. Now, even at 15, I could see that that was a ridiculous statement. McDonald's wasn't changing their preparation method to appease a minority. If most people wanted bacon grease slathered on their French fries, that's exactly what McDonald's would sell them. But people were getting more and more health conscious around then, and McDonald's business had been declining for years because of it. In other words, they were making this change in response to the exact market forces that conservatives like my dad idolize. What was actually happening was that my dad found himself in the minority, but that very concept triggers cognitive dissonance in middle-aged, middle-income conservative white men, so he conjured up an imaginary majority that, against all the evidence to the contrary, agreed with him. Of course, conjuring up imaginary majorities is nothing new to conservatism. Richard Nixon dubbed them the silent majority in a 1969 televised address about how, despite ubiquitous protests all over the country, most people still agreed with him that the Vietnam War was going great. Up until then, the silent majority was a euphemism for dead people. Nixon turned it into a euphemism for making dead people. Ten years later, Jerry Falwell Sr. christened his bigotry-based political organization the moral majority, despite being neither of those things. But the fiction he had to tell his followers was that there was this vast number of people withholding from the national political discourse that also agreed with them. It wasn't that they were an ever less relevant political force doomed by the inexorable momentum of demographics, but rather it's that they were part of a secret majority whose voice was being inexplicably excluded from the national conversation. And of course, this isn't some tactic that's relegated to the past. It's why some lady in Tupelo calls herself one million moms. It's why conservatives complain about cancel culture whenever the free market forces in the entertainment industry don't swing their way. 
It's why their rhetoric so often contains allusions to real Americans who live in the heartland and have wheat or grease related jobs. It's why they're so terrified by the increasing visibility of people who don't look like them. Right? Like every black lady in a Star Wars property is another reminder that their majority is a fiction. I bring this up because I, I think we atheists too often lose sight of this fact. It's, it's easy for us to do. I mean, obviously, the non-religious overrepresent people who don't mind standing outside the majority. We're far more likely to idealize independent thought and nonconformity. Now, whether we live up to those ideals is a different thing altogether. But for the purposes of the point I'm making here, it doesn't matter. Right. The, the, the point is, we don't have the same need to be broadly agreed with as they do. And because of that, we're likely to underestimate the importance of being open about our atheism. Of course, whenever I bring up visibility, I, I feel the need to caveat that with a list of exceptions for personal circumstance. Right. You, you're the best judge of whether you should be vocal about your disbelief. And I wouldn't encourage anybody to do so if they felt there was a legitimate threat to their health or, or to their income or, or whatever. But for the rest of us, it's important to be reminded sometimes that it does actually matter. I've talked with atheists who equate wearing atheist T-shirts or having atheist bumper stickers to trolling, right? Like as though the only purpose of proclaiming one's atheism is to antagonize Christians. But that's just not the case. It matters. It matters because the, a lot of these Christians can only spackle over that cognitive dissonance for so long. Their innate desire to follow the crowd can defend itself for a while with the familiar tactics of exclusion and imagination. But every time they come face to face with it, we've taken another chip out of that armor. And once we break through, that desire to follow the crowd can't help but manifest itself in following the crowd. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the Laverne and Shirley of atheism, Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick. Fellas, are you ready to make all our dreams come true? <laughs> okay, actually, Schlemiel, Schlemazel, Puzzle and Thunderstorm Incorporated. That's actually a really good summary of our company. <laughs> no, it is, yeah. Being honest. It's true. Yeah, uh, for the younger listeners, Laverne and Shirley was a TV show about two gay women, and not even the writers of the show knew it. Yeah, that's how they we got lost. In our lead story tonight, 21 people were killed by bullets from a legally obtained gun last week at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas. It was the deadliest school shooting in Texas history and the 27th school shooting of the year in the United States. That's an average of one school shooting every week in 2022. Wow. And of course, the Christian solution to the problem is thoughts, prayers, and Jesus and they really need to stretch the definition of thought for that to fit. Yeah, I don't think they should be able to keep using that one. Fuck. Possibly the worst commentary from a U.S. lawmaker came from Arizona State Representative Rick Gray. And the competition for that title is fucking fierce. Like, Ted Cruz, for example, is part of that competition. He blamed the shooting on a decline in church attendance. He did. Well, not to be outdone in stupid evil, Rick Gray gave a speech on the House floor explaining that the real cause of the massacre was evolution in biology class and the national religion of atheism. Oh, that one. Here in the United States. Yeah. Not to be outdone in stupid evil is the closest thing Republicans have to a platform at this point, right? <laughs> yeah. And can we say? Leading the world by a long shot. They yeah. are. They are the moon landing of stupid evil at this point, <laughs> my friends. They, though. Allegedly. So here's the exact words from Rick Ray. He's a Republican, by the way. I didn't mention that. What? He's a Republican. Oh, okay. Quote, the real core issue, and I'll be honest, this may be my bias, but this is how I see it. Yes, it fucking is your bias. Yep, You're dumb. Sure is. <laughs> sure is. Good disclaimer. For decades, for decades, just relax. It's for decades. Yes. For decades, we've been teaching our children in school, there is no God. Nope, we have not. You can't pray. Nope. You can't even pray on the field. Nope. Also not true. No. Nope. There is no God. Well, okay, <laughs> you got one right by accident, but we don't teach that directly. <laughs> That's just you start believing that if that you is, learn, you know, real yeah, things. A true statement, though, yeah, because right. of where the period is. Okay, continuing one more time. There are no absolutes. That contradicts itself. Pretty much unstable. Okay, it's that. survival of the fittest, friends. We have a state religion in the United States of America, even though there's supposed to be a separation of church and state. There is a state religion. It's Human secularism. What? Wow. <laughs> sick. Big sick. <laughs> it's human secularism, a.k.a. atheism. End quote. <laughs> Congratulations, Ricky. Once again, you've 
you've managed to accidentally point out that the opposite of your religion is learning things. <laughs> also, Ricky, you sure you want to mention that we're supposed to have separation of church and state <laughs> elected official who's very obviously suggesting everyone become his religion? Right. Are you sure you want to mention and that? And that the schools endorse it? Yeah. He does not hear himself. No. So, Rick, just a few Redlining notes for you. The Rickster, please. I tried to read your quote. I had to stop after every goddamn sentence <laughs> and be like, nope, or something like that. So, okay, a few more red line notes. First of all, it's secular humanism. Sure is. Not human <laughs> secularism. Did you think we have secular fauna? Like <laughs> secular peach trees growing in little dishes? What the fuck are you saying? I was listening to it earlier and I realized he got it confused for human centipede. He's like, human <laughs> secularism. Yep, I remember that. Also, another red line for you. If you think survival of the fittest means killing people, uh, you're a Nazi. That's you. You're <laughs> yeah. a Nazi. You were reading your kid's middle school biology textbook and you were like, beaks of finches changed over time. Okay, got it. Gun-based eugenics by people. Got it. Got it. That's <laughs> terrifying. How did that thought happen? Most importantly, final red line, you're an idiot. Yeah. You're just a dumb person. We've been teaching evolution in public schools for like a century. We got rid of mandatory Bible readings in public schools in 1963. And then we got an epidemic of school shootings that started in the late 90s. How does this time line up in your head? Did you think that was a really long fuse on us losing the mandatory Bible readings and then doing the shootings? Like we thought about Darwin for decades and then a bunch of Christian people that, well, didn't exist during those decades started doing atheist murder way later. What the fuck are you talking about? But oh, Honest answer, anything but gun control. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> sure is. Also, like, when you give credit for everything good in your life to an impossible concept like God, giving credit for everything bad in your life to invisible atheist science teachers kind of tracks, if you think about it, right? It's got to. Yeah. Yeah. So the obvious takeaway, don't sell machines of mass death to civilians. That's a pretty important one. No, don't do that. The Second Amendment is dumb and needs to go. But even if we keep it exactly as is, which we should not, but even if we did, there's nothing in it about a kid who just turned 18 being able to get two assault rifles and 375 bullets on fucking DoorDash days before carrying out a massacre. And, okay, here's the other thing we learned. Either prayer does not work or Christian people are not praying for an end to school shootings mm. or both. And yeah. uh, spoiler, it's both. Yeah, it is. So Christians, I know you're listening. Um, What would you say you fucking do here? <laughs> well, I, I believe the game plan is to get rid of doors, Heath. Um, oh, there the you doors. go. That's <laughs> and in Oklahoma, homophobia news. It might have flown under your radar last week, what with Christian theocrats rededicating themselves to letting your children die so that their constituents, hobby slash fantasy of being Mel Gibson and the Patriot could continue unimpeded. But in the corn-soaked state of Oklahoma, they're taking a much more proactive approach to killing children. As this week, Governor Kevin Stitt signed a law banning transgender children from using the school bathroom of their preference. Jesus. It's, it's amazing how fast they can swing from blaming school shootings on the fact that high school kids are bullied back to bullying high school kids, right? Doing exactly that. Yes. Well said. Okay, just to review, the legislative agenda in Oklahoma last week was, one, amoeba stage fetal rights. That's mm -hmm. important. And two... Which room are the kids shitting in? That's yep. <laughs> also important to us. We need to make laws. Yeah. So the bill, SB 615, threatens funding for school districts if they don't comply with the new transphobia policy and allows parents to sue school districts if they believe that their child had to share a restroom with a transgender classmate. And it does all this, ironically enough, in the name of safety. So uh quick reminder for those unfamiliar, the number of trans people who have attacked children in the bathroom is uh still zero. Hmm. And the number of people who have attacked trans people for using the bathroom of their choice is way, way fucking more than zero. Yeah. Just how the fuck is the party perpetually obsessed with kids genitals going to accuse the other side of being groomers? <laughs> it's insane. 
Okay, uh, just going over my to-do list here at the legislature. Hiring genital examiners for every public school. Check. All right. And now I got to ban Frozen because the sexual content is inappropriate for kids. <laughs> Great. Those are my two things. I'm a government official. Yeah. I have power. Yep. One other thing worth noting about this story, by the way, this bill is actually only the latest in a series of anti-trans bills that Oklahoma has passed this year. Earlier this year, there were bills banning transgender students from participating in school sports and banning non-binary birth certificates in the state. So, look, I know that right now everyone's focus is on, like, automatic weapons. And, hey, that's laudable on its own, right? Of course. But it's also probably good to keep in mind that there's plenty of killing children with just plain old hatred out there. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> and in opening arguments news tonight. Fantastic. <laughs> hey, I was proud of that one. We have an update on a story we've been following for damn near five years at this point. It all started in June of 2017 when the Vatican's first ever auditor general, Libero Meloni, abruptly resigned without explanation. Then, after months of conflicting and often nonsensical explanations of his resignation from the Holy See, Maloney broke his silence and claimed he was forced to step down after discovering evidence of possible illegal activity. That was in September of 2017, but since the Vatican is a sovereign autocratic fiefdom, there was no follow-up on that accusation. Well, this week, in a mostly unrelated fraud trial... Cardinal Angelo Bichu. Good on tight. Oh, yeah. B bless you. Would fuck the joke right up in this instance. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, as I was saying, Cardinal Bichu admitted for the first time that Maloney was forced to resign. And what's more, that he was forced to resign on direct order from Pope Francistic Fibrosis himself. Okay. Fired. Yeah. Well, that, right. That's called fired. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> they fired the guy that they hired to check if they should fire anybody. Yep. Fuck. Guys, guys, I'm starting to think that maybe the good Pope isn't the compliment people keep saying it is, you know? Yeah, no, it's all relative. Now, when Brunch. it was first announced last year, this trial was heralded as some great symbol of Franurism's commitment to justice because Bachu was at one time, anyway, the third ranking official in the entire Vatican. And just like most of the Pope's gestures of reform, it sounds really good as long as you don't follow up on it. Right. Much like the story we started with, wherein the Pope and his then number two man, George fucking Pell, made a big show of empowering this new auditor general to, quote, go anywhere and everywhere, end quote, in his review of the finances and management of the Vatican, like any Vatican department, actually. And then two years later, they fired him and removed PricewaterhouseCoopers as their auditors altogether. Like fucking Enron. Jesus. Yes. <laughs> and and they didn't bring anyone else on board to replace them. Right. They, they never empowered those people even to release anything that they found. Yeah. So this whole thing, it's the Catholic Church's version of the inspector general system. Yeah. That's the thing we started in the U.S. after Watergate to investigate government corruption and be an overseer. So here's the sequence of events at the Vatican. They hired Maloney to investigate corruption. And then he started doing that job. And the Pope was like, guys, that. Why would we do that? Fucks up our whole thing. He's, he's fired. He has to be <laughs> yes. fired now. And Maloney at that point was like, hey, uh, I definitely just found some corruption right now, just now when you fired me. And they were like, I already fired too late. Couldn't hear you. Yep, la, la, la. Right? Yeah. <laughs> the Catholic Church is like that friend that always bitches to you about how they can't find a nice guy. And you have to not point out that their last boyfriend's name was Chunch and they met when he threw up on her at a state fair. <laughs> You're just like, this is, this is you. It's hurtful. Now, uh, of course, until now, the official line from the Vatican was that the ouster came because of a clash of operational styles, which is I mean, it's probably Two spaces after the period. Yeah, no, no, I mean, it's probably true in, in, in so much as Maloney's operational style was legal. Right. <laughs> but you fast forward a couple of years and now Cardinal Bechu crawls out from beneath the bus that Frankie just tossed him under and found his way to a witness stand where he's asked about Maloney's 2017 departure. And at first he declines to answer, quote, out of love for the Holy Father, end quote, <laughs> which, which is the Vatican equivalent of saying, I don't want to tell the truth because it would make the Pope look guilty. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the next day, apparently with Frankie's permission, he testified that the call for Maloney's resignation came from the top. What's more, he says that Maloney was fired after hiring outside investigators to spy on high-ranking Vatican officials. 
Okay, that was a weird case for the Spy Kids. That yeah. was it got dark. And can I say, by far the most dangerous? Yeah, right. No, uh, wrong investigators to hire in this <laughs> instance. So they made a noir sequel, but they didn't release it. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah right, for good reason. Deep web. So yeah. Sorry to throw so much shit at you all at the same time, but it's a quick reminder that Pope Francis's reforms are the religious equivalent of that time that BP made their logo green to convince you that they were environmentally conscious. OK, just don't take their <laughs> shit seriously. And next up in headlines, we have a story about Donald Trump's foray into the online media game. And uh, it's not going well at all, <laughs> despite getting over a billion dollars for investors. His attempt to add an alt-right version of Twitter and Facebook called Truth Social is still going nowhere. Should have been called Twitter, by the way. Oh, Come nice. On. Yeah. yeah. Obviously. Mm -hmm. And their whole business plan at Twitter, what should be Twitter, is a social media app. And they still don't have an app for Android available. Well, that's tricky. Only I, you know, people it's can, tricky. can get on the thing. And if you search for Truth Social on Google, it says no information is available for this page they prevented us from creating a page description for some reason. Well, apparently, Trump decided to pivot and start his own streaming service for shows that got canceled by the, by the culture. The plan is to create a platform to promote evangelical Christianity, guns, and anti-woke programming. So... Newsmax, Pure Flix, The Daily Wire, Christian Cinema, Infowars, OHN, and Fox News weren't doing it for him? <laughs> nope. He thinks the market needs an eighth white supremacy network? You're just naming woke shit, Eli. Yeah. yeah that's true. <laughs> See, when, when Heath said it would promote Christianity, guns, and racism, I was going to compare, I was going to be like, oh, it's going to compete with the Republican Party, but then I remembered it has a platform, so that doesn't work. <laughs> right, that's true. <laughs> so, the Trump Media and Technology Group, TMTG, filed a prospectus for the new streaming service, and that service is going to be called TMTG+. Fuck it. Prejudice Network was right there. Guys. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> That's excellent. <laughs> so, according to that prospectus, it's going to feature, quote, blue-collar comedy. God, <laughs> such a bad start. <laughs> yeah, Jesus. baby! Wow. Canceled shows... Trump-specific programming. It's de-escalating so fast. <laughs> Trump-specific programming, faith-based shows. Oh, it is. Family <laughs> entertainment, shows that embrace the Second Amendment, and news. I'm going to add an asterisk right there. <laughs> news, end quote. I'm sorry. I just can't get over the idea that it's going to be like a bunch of Christo-fascist propaganda and season two of Firefly. Yeah. I think you guys are really into that one. <laughs> This prospectus also added, quote, TMTG's programming will provide a non-woke alternative to the programs offered by streaming services that operate in an increasingly politicized environment. TMTG will not censor the creators of entertainment, nor will it insist that its programming push some particular political ideology. <laughs> Except you literally just said Trump-specific programming yeah. Yeah. in your description of your thing moments ago. It's fine. Continuing. TMTG believes that embracing diverse perspectives will differentiate TMTG plus in the current crowded media and entertainment marketplace, end quote. OK, so first of all, if you're not going to censor your creators, it's all white supremacy and porn. That's the entire website. But secondly, <laughs> nothing says we're committed to diversity, like saying that you're anti woke. Yep. Is that is that your that's what they said? Or, yes. OK, Heath. Noah, I've been angling for a scathing atheist TV show for a while now, and we can test their premise at the same time. <laughs> Come on. Bullshit, Sue. And uh, by the way, a little, little background on this. Just for the record, a bunch of the investors who gave Trump over a billion dollars in seed money have already admitted how stupid that was of them to give him that money. The company that's taking TMTG public even mentioned that fact in the official document they had to file before selling any stock. The document has a dedicated section entitled Risks Related to Our Chairman Donald Trump. And it says things like, yeah, this guy goes bankrupt like constantly. <laughs> <laughs> he lost at owning casinos as the house. That yeah. happened. And he's being investigated for like so many crimes, like so many guys. It's so many fucking crimes. Anyway, who wants to buy some stock? We're selling <laughs> stock with that guy as the chairman. <laughs> Still a much better pitch than I've ever heard about an NFT, so... <laughs> no, that's fair. That is fair. 
Yeah. So obviously TMTG plus the, the prejudice network is what we're calling it. That's going to be a garbage fire, but it also just wrote our entire schedule for God awful movies for the next several and they're bankrupt. Okay. Oh, well, never mind. Oh, uh, could could that? We could get some archives maybe, but yeah, they're gone. And in snap crackle top news, thanks to a pride campaign from 2021 and a doctored image from 4chan, Christians were convinced that one of the Rice Krispie mascots is trans this week. <laughs> and you know what that means. What are the guys talking about? It's the newest, the greatest Christian freakout. Yes, the super duper obviously edited image is made up to look like a CNN story from May 20th and reads with the headline, quote, Kellogg's spokesperson announces Rice Krispie mascot Pop is now a trans woman, end quote. And Pop has rosy cheeks and a purple ponytail in the picture. <laughs> yeah, it's so sad. Look, if I worked for Kellogg's marketing department, I would lose my job explaining that, no, no, they're still all bisexual trans men like they've always been. <laughs> <laughs> I love that a non-zero number of stupid fucking bigots were just sadly dumping out a big tray of Rice Krispie Treats last week when they heard about this <laughs> fake story. <laughs> Also, a different non-zero number that ate them anyway while weeping, just being like, but they're so delicious. I don't know. I'm still going to be big, and I swear. Yeah. Yeah, they are delicious, though. Like, Let's just plant that flag. So good. So in spite of the super obvious satire and the fact that the headline spelt crispy wrong, yep. that didn't stop Christian idiots from picking this up and running with it. Newsmax host Grant Stitchenfield got super fucking confused and one on this absolutely insane rant about Lucky Charms, which, yes, is a different That's cereal. That's a different cereal, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In his weird rant, he called the Lucky Charms leprechaun gay and, and said of, I guess, Lucky Charms, quote, the cereal is rainbow hearts covered in edible glitter. How nice. Give me a break. Here's the worst part. The cereal slogan, too amazing to put into a box, and then lists the space for kids to write in their own pronouns. Seriously. For those of you who want to vilify me for those comments, right? Right there? Aren't you just as offended by the flamboyant rainbow hearts and glitter as a symbol of gayness? See, there are two standards here. Okay. Quote. I'm offended that he thinks hearts are the only charm in Lucky Charms. <laughs> right? Yes. It's idiot. <laughs> it's a whole fucking rainbow in there. Yeah. One last thing, as is always the case when the Christians invent some new gay menace, we got one of my favorite things in the universe, the dead-eyed, hateful statement of the company, <laughs> which in this case came from Kellogg's spokesperson, Chris Banner, who said in an email to several press outlets, quote, we have made no changes to the Rice Krispies mascot, Snap, Crackle, and Pop, <laughs> <laughs> adding... What happened to us? We used to fly to the moon. You, Eli, did he actually say that last part? No, but they wanted to. I could yeah, tell they right, really yeah, wanted obviously, to. I'm that's very speaking, obviously wanted speaking to. Speaking from their heart. Rainbow heart. <laughs> and finally tonight, in Devotions 11 news, a golden tabernacle valued at over $2 million was stolen from a Catholic church in Brooklyn last week. The theft, which the Diocese ha, of Brooklyn... Devotions was, 11, that's excellent. Well, thank you. Oh, it's fantastic, yeah. <laughs> The theft, I was, I was going to go with like Ocean's 11, 16 or something like that, but I didn't think that would, I didn't think that would really play. So the theft, which the Diocese of Brooklyn is calling, quote, a brazen crime of disrespect and hate, end quote, happened sometime between Thursday evening and Saturday afternoon of last week. And Eli was with me the entire time. I can account for all of his movements that day. It's true. This is absolutely not part of a prank war, mm -mm. even though in addition to stealing the tabernacle, the thieves also appear to have cut the head off of a random angel statue. <laughs> mm, pretty sure the Simpsons did it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that the diocese is like, that is for inspiring awe in the peasants that we can keep raping their children, damn it. Not for, you know, whatever useful stuff they're going to use it for, like drugs. Yeah, or right. Money. <laughs> so... All right, so the tabernacle, which is apparently the bejeweled box that they keep the Eucharist in when they're not actively devouring the flesh of their god, uh, was first completed in 1895. It's so insane when you say their things out loud. Yeah, it, that, yeah. that's all it takes, yeah. <laughs> it's our whole shtick. So it, it, now it's been described in some press, the tabernacle has been described in some press outlets as solid gold, but I think it's actually silver with 18 karat gold overlaid 
on the silver. It's also bedecked with an assortment of jewels that the church apparently got by asking their parishioners back in 1890 or whatever to just bring in their jewelry and donate it to the world's most ostentatious bread box. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the guidebook on the church's website points out that the tabernacle is, quote, guarded by its own security system, which includes a, quote, electronically operated burglar proof safe, end quote. Huh. Yeah. Look, look for a mostly to be inserted in that description soon. <laughs> All right, guys. A lesson learned. We need to get a new safe and put that inside a safe because oh, I think that was the problem. <laughs> Also, pro tip, if you have a giant box that's encrusted in jewels, don't describe its security system on your website. There you go. Literally nobody <laughs> but the people who want to steal it care about that information. <laughs> so, so, yeah, apparently the thieves just cut through that burglar proof safe with a saw. They also cut into a different safe, which the church says was empty at the time which either means they have a decorative safe at that church or they were using that to hide money from their rape victims. One of those. The crime was discovered by Father Frank Tomino, who noticed the door of the church was ajar when he walked by Saturday afternoon. He went in to find the tabernacle missing and the Eucharist strewn about the altar. Uh, Tomino said that the site made him ill, which, like, to be fair, for him, that's like, you know, he walked in there and saw body parts strewn around a crime scene. So I get it. <laughs> the cops arrived. They're like, hey, man, did you... Did you draw a chalk outline of Jesus around those crackers on the ground? <laughs> What's happening? There was blood everywhere, sir. That's peach schnapps. You can't just make everything. <laughs> no, and, and look, I, I'm not trying to endorse theft by making light of this. I get that there's a historical and artistic value to this thing that's going to be lost forever when it's melted down. But the fact that a tax-exempt charitable organization has a $2 million cracker barrel was the real crime all along. So I have absolutely zero sympathy for the so-called victims. Yeah, plus the history of that box is the Catholic Church has a lot of money. Yep. There, I summed it up for you. Mm -hmm. Now, help me preheat the oven. Wait, you, it was Jews with me come off the by whole themselves. time. Okay, <laughs> so with that Andrew-approved closing in the books and a bunch of other ones on the cutting room floor, we're going to close the headlines for the night. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Jumanji. And when we come back, Don Ford will be here to fantasize about adventure. But for the last time, Eli, you can talk about your new parenting show, Dear Old Dads, next week. This week, Andrew has some super serious stuff that he wants to talk to the audience about, and we just finished Matron. It's just, you know, I just don't want to pull the audience in too many directions at once. No, that's that's fair. That's fair. I, I'm, I have the sponsor copy right here. It's it's actually a new advertiser this week. Oh, is it? Yeah, brand new. Uh, it actually just came from Audio Bang. Audio Boom. Yep. Them. That. Yes. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. And action. You don't need to call action before the ads, right? We. we yes. Action. Hey, Eli. What's the matter? <laughs> Oh, hey, Noah. Yeah, old Hoofy here really is having a tough time. Who's Hoofy? He's my pet deer. He's just so young and inexperienced, you see. Well, why don't you try Old Deer Dads? Seriously, dude. It's a legitimate sponsor. What is what is Old Deer Dads, Noah? Old Deer Dads has the worldwise and street smart deer you need to grow your pet deer into the stag you've always hoped they would be. Eli, this is literally nonsense. Almost done with the ad, Noah, that we got paid to do. So get your deer a dad that is old and dear, the other sense of the word, even though you spelled them wrong both times, at olddeerdads.com. Olddeerdads.com. Please listen to Eli's new podcast. That's their, that's their catchphrase. No. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we make jokes a lot on Bible Peace Theater about how Eli doesn't read ahead. Or at least I thought we were making jokes, but apparently not only does he not read ahead, but he doesn't even glance ahead. Like, enough to realize that there are only four or five pages left in the book of the Bible that he's satirizing, which is why we're happy to bring you this week's snack-sized version of Bible Peace Theater. How can you say arming teachers is a good idea? What are you no, talking you're about? You're not listening. It's not for the mass shooters. It's for transphobic parents and people who don't like critical race theory. Oh, uh, okay. That's actually a, a really good idea. I like that. Thank you. Hey, guys. You guys ready for uh, Bible Peace Theater? Oh, yeah. The part of the show where we act out the Bible to save our audience from reading it. You bet. Okay. So where did we leave off? All right. So 
Hezekiah was the king of Israel, and unlike his predecessors, he actually listened to God, so God hadn't killed him yet. And he was played by me. Don Ford, voice of fantasy and adventure. Don, did you install a spotlight in our house so you could introduce yourself? Yes. I knew that plumber looked familiar. Okay, that makes sense. You guys don't do that? Okay. Anyway, one day Hezekiah takes ill. Oh, oh, I am sick. Sick to death, one might say. You called for me, King Hezekiah. Yes, Isaiah, I am terribly ill. Can you speak to God to see if he can help a guy out? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, no, I thought the God, uh, he said you're going to live. Uh, just, you know, smear some figs on your boil. Smear some figs on my boil. Yep, yep. And did God send, I don't know, a, a sign that I would be healed? I mean, he sent me, but no, no, it's fine. Let me do a magic trick to, you know, put a button on your magic healing for you. Oh, sorry. It's fine, it's fine. Uh, no, you know what? Uh, God is going to move the sun 10 degrees. Wow. Won't that, um, won't that obliterate the universe? No, no, for some reason, uh, it will not. Do, uh, just do, look at your shadow. Oh, it's moving. There's absolutely no reason it could be doing that except for God. Right? And look, now God turned the sun into a doggy. Oh, uh, okay, man, that's, that's too far. Yeah, right, no, it's just a shadow thing. Never mind, never mind. Didn't even get to do the bird. What's that? I said something about God's word. God's word. And this one is the part of the same battalion, but it has a longer range. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. And now the D&D minifigs are in this case over here. Oh, God. Okay. When you look at the time, yeah, I got to. This is this is awesome. But I, I got to head back to Babylonia right now. Oh, Oh, really? I haven't even shown you my collection of Dragon Magazines. Dragon Magazines. Wow. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Sad, original sad print. I, yeah, no, that's, that sounds great. Uh, real sad to miss that. But uh, I got to go. I got to do, um, do Babylon stuff. Okay. Hey, who was that? Oh, that was the son of the king of Babylon. I was just showing him all the cool stuff in my kingdom. Yeah, yeah. No, I thought that might be it. So I got bad news. Uh-oh. Yeah, what's the bad news? Yeah, that guy, he's going to steal all your stuff, uh, and your sons will be eunuchs in his palace. Oh, really? Is it because I showed him my stuff? No, it's because you buy pre-painted minifigures. Okay, that's fair. So Hezekiah dies, and Manasseh becomes king, but he's super bad. He, like, sets up idols. He sacrifices his sons to the wrong god. He builds stuff in high places. So, so God makes an especially odd promise to his prophets. Prophets, hear me. Yes, God? Manasseh has done great evil in his life. I will make so much evil come up on Jerusalem that people who hear about it shall have tingly ears. Uh, sorry, uh, tingly ears? Yes, yes. You know, like, uh... Like that, uh, ee, th th that noise. Oh, oh, you mean tinnitus? Y y yes, that. Uh, okay. No, no, okay, that's that's bad. Well, I and, and, and I, I haven't finished yet. I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. I, I have no idea what you're talking about. Do you mean literally you're going to turn Jerusalem upside it's down? Gonna, it's going to be bad and scary. You guys are too literal. Why would turning it upside down be part of dish wiping? I, I think he means to get the back. You know, never mind. Never mind. Okay, let's see. Uh, bad king, bad king, good king, breaks the elders, kills some people, then bad king, bad king, bad king, and then the Babylonians destroy Jerusalem and take their stuff. And, and that's uh, the end of the book. Oh, that's like, uh, it's not a lot now. Yeah, there's not a lot of stories in Kings. Okay, but, I mean, what did we learn? Well. So it seems there's a conundrum in the podcast. Bible pieces always ended in a song in the past. Noah used to write poems, too. And then I'd turn them into songs. 
songs for all of you But as it happens, one fell between the cracks So I have nowhere to start Do you think I pull these songs out of my ass? It isn't true What can I do? Cause I'm not gonna read King's Two. Fuck you, it's a crap shoot Way too long to get into for just one song Go Google it to go to SparkNotes.com Cause I'm not gonna read King's Two. So I've come to surmise that the problem it lies In those biblical tomes where inspiration goes to die Don't wanna do it, couldn't get through But I'm not the guy, so fucking screw it And I think it's kinda crazy And I might come off as lazy But I'm rejecting that you're expecting me To come up with amazing lyrics Don't need your panegyrics The evidence is empiric That I'm not gonna read Kings 2 Fuck you, it's a crap shoot Way too long to get into for just one song Go Google it Go to sparknotes.com Cause I'm not gonna read it Fuck Elijah dies off, leaves Elisha in charge And he thrives at the prophet stuff Jehu kills two kings and poor Jezebel flings out a window and she snuffs it Assyria comes for us, Ezekiel's victorious Cause God thinks he's glorious Genesi is bad and with Judah God had it Then something about Babylon Ugh. Fuck why did I read Kings 2? Fuck you, it's a crap shoot Way too long, but I got into it for just one song. I googled it, dude. Went to sparknotes.com. But why did I read Kings 2? Thank you, Anna. As always, you are so too good for us that I feel inadequate to even sufficiently thank you for your work. Now, before we go tonight, I want to do something a bit unusual. Friend of the show, Andrew Torres of the Opening Arguments podcast asked if he could have your ear for a few minutes for a bit of a call to action. So, class, we have a guest. Andrew, take it away. Hi, this is Andrew Torres of the Opening Arguments podcast, and this is a call to action. It's a way you can make a difference just by sending an email. This is a baseball story that's not about baseball. Gabe Kapler is the reigning National League Manager of the Year. Last year, he led the San Francisco Giants to 107 wins, which is the most ever. It goes back to 1883. This year, the Giants are 25 and 21. They're one of the better teams in the league. And yet, some people want Gabe Kapler fired. And as you might suspect, it's for reasons that have nothing to do with baseball. You see, last Friday... In the wake of the Uvalde school shooting, Kapler wrote a heart-wrenching blog post called Home of the Brave, question mark. I was going to read some of, of the most moving parts, but I realized it's all moving. Here are his words. The day 19 children and two teachers were murdered, we held a moment of silence at sporting events around the country. Then we played the national anthem and we went on with our lives. Players, staff, and fans stood for the moment of silence, grieving the lives lost. And then we, myself included, continued to stand, proudly proclaiming ourselves the land of the free and the home of the brave. We didn't stop to reflect on whether we're actually free and brave after this horrific event. We just stood at attention. When I was the same age as the children in Uvalde, My father taught me to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance when I believed my country was representing its people well, or to protest and stay seated when it wasn't. I don't believe it is representing us well right now. This particular time, an 18-year-old walked into a store, bought multiple assault rifles and hundreds of rounds of ammunition, walked into a school with an armed resource officer in its own police district, and was able to murder children for nearly an hour. Parents begged and pleaded with police officers to do something. Police officers who had weapons and who received nearly 40% of the city's funding as their children were being murdered. We elect our politicians to represent our interests. Immediately following the shooting, we were told we needed locked doors and armed teachers. We were given thoughts and prayers. We were told it could have been worse And we just need love. But we weren't given bravery. And we aren't free. 
The police on the scene put a mother in handcuffs as she begged them to go in and save her children. They blocked parents trying to organize to charge in to stop the shooter, including a father who learned his daughter was murdered while he argued with the cops. We aren't free when politicians decide that the lobbyists and the gun industries are more important than our children's freedom to go to school without needing bulletproof backpacks and active shooter drills. I'm often struck before our games by the lack of delivery of the promise of what our national anthem represents. We stand in honor of a country where we elect representatives to serve us, to thoughtfully consider and enact legislation that protects the interests of all the people in this country and to move this country forward towards the vision of that shining city on the hill. But instead, we thoughtlessly link our moment of silence and grief with the equally thoughtless display of celebration for a country that refuses to take up the concept of controlling the sale of weapons used nearly exclusively for the mass slaughter of human beings. We have our moment over and over, and then we move on without demanding real change from the people we empower to make those changes. We stand, we bow our heads, and the people in power leave on recess, celebrating their own patriotism at every turn. Every time I place my hand over my heart and remove my hat, I'm participating in a self-congratulatory glorification of the only country where these mass shootings take place. On Wednesday, I walked out onto the field. I listened to the announcement as we honored the victims in Uvalde. I bowed my head I stood for the national anthem, Metallica riffed on City Connect guitars. My brain said, drop to a knee. My body didn't listen. I wanted to walk back inside. Instead, I froze. I felt like a coward. I didn't want to call attention to myself. I didn't want to take away from the victims or their families. This was a baseball game. There was a rock band. There were lights, pageantry. I knew that thousands of people were using this game to escape the horrors of the world for just a little bit. I knew that thousands more wouldn't understand the gesture, would take it as an offense to the military, to veterans, to themselves. But I am not okay with the state of this country. I wish I hadn't let my discomfort compromise my integrity. I wish that I could have demonstrated what I learned from my dad, that when you're dissatisfied with your country, you let it be known through protest. The home of the brave should encourage this. And that's it. Gabe Kapler announced he wasn't going to mindlessly trot out onto the field and place his hand over his heart anymore. He was going to use his position, his visibility to do what he could to stand for change. Now, you may know San Francisco as the town where an African-American quarterback sending a similar message got blackballed out of the league for quietly taking a knee during the national anthem. I don't know the full story there, but I do know that right now, the same people that drummed out Colin Kaepernick, led by ex-Giants ball player Aubrey Huff, a MAGA hat-wearing, true-believing Trumper, are organizing their followers to flood the Giants with complaints about Gabe Kapler. And they have. Hate is a powerful motivator. And the Giants are a business. They care about their bottom line. The risk that Gabe Kapler gets fired over this is real. It's happened before. Unless we show them that courage and social change can be good for business, too. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take 30 seconds and send an email to the Giants. I'm going to give you the email addresses in a minute. And I want you to say three simple things in your own words. They are, one, I stand with Gabe Kapler. I support the message. Two, I applaud the Giants for having the courage to back their manager I applaud the Giants for standing against gun violence and for not shutting him down. And number three, and this is the important part, I'll be supporting the team financially. Listening to games, going to games, buying a Gabe Kapler jersey, telling my friends to do the same, whatever. And that's it. I know a lot of you feel the same way I do. And right now, our voices are being overwhelmed. They are being drowned out 
by right-wing hate monsters who are boycotting the Giants, threatening never to go to games, threatening not to buy merchandise until Kapler gets fired. So if you agree with Gabe Kapler's message, if you were at all moved by what he said, let's let his bosses know that we support him. That's the president of baseball operations, Farhan Zaidi, and the CEO, Larry Baer, B-A-E-R. Their email addresses are, get out a pen and paper, your computer, fzaidi at sfgiants.com. That is F-Z-A-I-D-I at S-F-G-I-A-N-T-S dot C-O-M. And L Bear at sfgiants.com. L-B-A-E-R at S-F-G-I-A-N-T-S dot com. That's fzaidi at sfgiants.com and L Bear at sfgiants.com. Thank you so much for listening to this. Thank you for writing emails. Together we can make a difference. All right, Noah, you ready to do the next ad? Yeah, uh, where's uh, where's Heath? Oh, he, um, well, he is. Did Eli, did you lock him in the costume trunk in the attic again? We were playing spooky ghosts. Great. Okay, this this one is a real sponsor, right? Not just an excuse for you to plug your podcast with Tom and Thomas that comes out on Friday? No, no, it's for Raycons. We do ads for them all the time. Uh, well, I mean, they are a, a real sponsor. Exactly. Action. What did I say? You know what? It's fine. It's fine. Hey, Eli, what are you listening to? Oh, hello, Noah. I was just listening to the brand new podcast, Dear Old Dads. <sighs> it's about parenting, masculinity, and our own experience being both parents and sons. Available Friday on iTunes. I, I see. And how are the headphones you're listening to it on? They're fine. You know, in today's world of parenting, there are so few places for men to join together and talk about fatherhood. That's what Dear Old Dads is there for. It's there to teach, but it's also there to learn. Much like the Buddha. Say literally anything about the headphones they are paying us for this ad for, please. They're made by that guy who fucked Kim Kardashian. Okay. Dear old dads. (laughs) (laughs) It's time for the part of the show that comes next. Listener feedback. This is the part of the show that sneaks up on you when you're least expecting it. Now... We're going to have to do this one without Heath, which is a damn shame considering the feedback in <laughs> for question. For medical reasons. <laughs> yeah, right, right, yeah, for, for, for reasons of his blood pressure. So look, normally we don't do listener feedback on the show if all we're going to do is make fun of the person who sent it. I, you know, the whole point of this segment is to open up a line of dialogue with the listeners, and dunking on the people who reach out to us is not a great way to do that. Yeah, so just for the record, Noah is totally dismissing my idea for a brand new segment called Eli's Internet Feuds, and he's doing it on the air. Yep, yep, he sure is. Uh, no, <laughs> but, I, but I have to say, there is a level of stupid where that rule of thumb no longer counts. There are some listeners whose feedback is so impossibly asinine that we actually want to cut off that line of communication altogether, and holy shit, was that the case this week. Uh, Plus, I did a whole diatribe last week about how rationality and atheism aren't as intertwined as we like to think that they are, and this email is damn good evidence that I'm right. So, here we go. (laughs) Chris writes, I'm quite disappointed that you won't use widely available evidence and facts to determine that Trump did, in fact, win the election. Oh, it's this kind of email. Okay. (laughs) Biden cheated. The proof is widely available. Yeah, it's weird how none of it made it into the multiple documentaries we watched about it. Even the ones that were named after proof. Yeah. Um, He goes on, why would you not consider it? I thought you to be a critical thinker. Oh, you're getting warmer. You're getting warmer. He's he's almost there. (laughs) No, but he doesn't. He turns he turns the other way. But you made up your mind about politics and stopped considering that you may be getting lied to and you won't budge. You budged on religion, so why not politics? (laughs) Again, you're getting warmer. (laughs) I'm not asking you to switch sides. Who the fuck am I to you? Great question. Such a great great question, question, Chris. Chris. (laughs) Uh, I'm just asking you to try harder to find the truth in politics. Stop using Google search for one thing. Yeah, nothing fucks up your argument quite like credible sources. Hey, right? Chris. No, no, he goes, he, no, he explains. They have algorithms in place to prevent the truth from coming out. Try 
duck duck go mm. <laughs> but with this caveat although they are now censoring the truth about russia and ukraine okay so chris wrote us to say your sources are lying to you and so are mine <laughs> Please take me very seriously. <laughs> it's not the great start Chris is hoping for. No, nope, I don't think so. <laughs> he goes out. He's, wait, 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 there's so much more. The Democrats are destroying or our country sick. Today, okay. Biden has started a war for no reason, forced vaxes on hundreds of millions of people, millions of whom have died from the vaccine alone, all caps. Wow. And triple vaxxed people are catching COVID multiple times, whereas unvaxxed are much less likely to get it. See, these are the kind of hard hitting facts you can only find on DuckDuckGo. Chris. Well, you can't find them on Google. That's for sure. <laughs> Thanks, bud. Love your atheism content anyway. Chris, if I could release this show to everybody but you, I would. I absolutely would. Chris, I'm considering shutting our show down in spite of the several cancer patients I know who are listening just to hurt you, Chris. There, there you go. To yeah. hurt you. <laughs> He go, he goes on. My only hope at this point is that when I catch up on your latest content, you will have realized how fucked up the Democrats are currently being and will acknowledge your mistakes in your thinking. Something that Democrats are rarely capable of do. Oh, sorry, are rarely capable of due to, as you put it, hubris, ego, control, freakiness, etc. How dare you say I would put anything like that, Chris? Control, freakiness. Whose podcast has Chris been listening to? I need to know. Chris, did you click a wrong? You clicked wrong, Chris. I must have. I hope you clicked wrong. Anyway, he he then goes on to offer. He says, I would ha I would be happy to send irrefutable, literally, evidence your way if you're open to it. I'm hoping your critical thinking nature can look past your ego and acknowledge you were wrong. Sure, sure thing, Chris. There's a direct line on my P.O. box deep inside your own anus. Uh, so just shove your evidence up there real deep and I'll get it eventually. Now, now, now Noah, let's not be close minded. Chris, I would love to see your evidence. Please email it to me. We don't do feedback segments nearly as often as I'd like. And you are uh, what we call in the biz, the goose that lays the golden egg, Chris. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's way more of a response than the email deserves. But for the record, whenever I find stuff like this in my inbox, I always respond with the same three little words, Mark as spam. <laughs> all right. Well, Heath is still screaming in that box. We locked him in in the attic. So that's all the feedback you get. If you want more, keep sending those emails, tweets and Facebook messages. You'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. <laughs> Before we relapse tonight, I wanted to let you know about a new podcast you should add to your list. Look for Dear Old Dads debuting tomorrow wherever you get your podcasts. Anyway, that's all the blast movie we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show, The Skeptocrat, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern time on Monday, and even newer episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 Eastern on Tuesday, and an even newer episode of our half sister show, Citation Nita, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, this podcast couldn't climax if I neglected to thank Keith Enright for his strength, Eli Bosnick for his dexterity, Lucid Illusions for her intelligence, Andrew Torres for his wisdom, Don Ford for his constitution, and Anna Bosnick for her charisma. I also need to thank the guys from the Champions TTRPG podcast for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. If you need more RPG actual play podcasts in your life, be sure to check out the show notes for a link to their show. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's most marvelous Matreon ears. Andrew, Layla, Cabernathius, Tylan, Nathan, Punspector, Elizabeth, Nicole, Three Jameses, Reluctant Skeptic, Bobby, That Alien Guy, Benjamin, Katie, Casey, Daffy, Saturn, Parasocial Activity 3, Cynthia, T.E. Premium is the Pits, David, Camp Quest, Michigan Needs Volunteers, Dustin, Dan, Laura, Old School, Scott, Aubrey, Lost in the Podcast, First Feral Cowboy, Elvin, The Painter, Destruct Boy, John B., Christopher, Two Chris's, Dylan, Amber, Ian, Steven, Sarah, Mike, Tyler, Matt from Canada, Offer, Zombie Nerd 42, Rebecca, Mr. Griff, Daniel, Steven, Ruth, Mary, Ian, Josh, Gage, Florida Man News, Natasha, Sa Scotty Sauce Fingers, Laura, Ghost Wolf, Adam, Dave, Not a Law Talking Guy, Jana, Nella, Palooza, David, Old Crow, Sean, Phil, Eric, White Chocolate, Temptation, Bits, Clortho, Keep, Astrup, Gozer, and Bradley. Whew. 
whose genitals will take your breath away even more than trying to belt out 76 names without an inhale. Together, these 76 people request location, desires, podcasts, and Ghostbuster characters made sure Matreon went out with a bang this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the money it takes to give some to us, but if you do, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash gaythingatheists, whereby you own early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but we haven't found the magic words yet, don't worry, we will try again next week. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of B. Andrew Torres. Tim Robinson handles our social media, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the content info on the content page at scathingatheist.com. Who am I in this one? I'm somebody, right? You're just in a... Uh, you're Isaiah. That's yeah. Right. Have I done Isaiah before? Um, I'm, I'm just wondering if I should give him yes, a voice. Yes, I think so. All right. Then I shouldn't probably give him a voice. Yeah, because continuity is a thing we strive yeah, for. Yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved.